I'm going to speak to you about the internet and everything. I'm going to define it for you, and I'm going to talk to you about what the implications of the internet and everything are on education, but also on our world in general. And so, we'll start with the big picture. Now, basically, the internet, we are, in, we are in this time, and it's not just the internet, but it's, it's lots of technologies which are creating this major structural dislocation that is occurring on our planet. And it doesn't matter whether you are in oil and gas, and it doesn't matter whether you're in finance, and it doesn't matter whether you're in retail, your business will have to change. Now, some, some areas are moving more quickly to adopt new technologies, and some areas are very slow. Education tends to be slow. And the reason is because there are many educators who simply believe that we have done it this way since the 15th century. <laughs> and, and I don't know any reason why we have changed. I stand here and I lecture and you sit there and you listen and that is how this is going to work. The problem is that that just doesn't scale. And so education tends to be a foot dragger. However, communications is not, retail is not, Healthcare has very strong uh, 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 forces that are making healthcare change. So we are in this major period of dislocation. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that the network is at the core of many of these dislocations. And I'm actually old enough to remember the left-hand part of this chart. I was pivotal to some of these technologies and the deployment of some of these technologies. And I won't dwell on how these technologies have, have changed over time, but we are now in this period where we are connecting the unconnected. And we call that the Internet of Everything. We, we believe, we believe that approximately 99% of everything on our planet which could be connected is not. Which means there's a big upside. And we'll, we're going to talk about what some of those upsides will be. People often ask me, does that mean it's the end? Is that the end of what we do? No, it's actually something beyond it. It's called ACI. And ACI stands for Application Centric Infrastructure. And basically that, what that means is we build very intelligent infrastructure. And that's a, that's a speech for another day. But it has to do with excessive intelligence being built into the network that does things for you in a very good way. So, we're in the, this period, and we're going to call it the Internet of Everything right now. Well, let's define what that is. So the Internet of Everything is basically people communicating with other people. Well, we've done that for some time now, and actually mobile phone penetration globally is amazing. Even in darkest effort, actually. I've been there many times, and it's not dark at all. It's uh, but however, you, when, you, when you visit people like the Maasai in Western Kenya, and you hear a phone ring, and this big tall guy reaches into his red garment and pulls out a smartphone. And believe me, he has nothing. He has multiple wives and a few cows, and that's his whole life. And he's got a smartphone. So. So the internet everything involves people communicating with people, but it also involves people communicating with machines, and we're going to talk more about that. And it involves machines talking to other machines or sensor-based technology, all connected to data, because data matters. We collect data, and then the data may affect how people interact, and all connected via process. So the internet of everything is network connections of people and data and processes and things. Now, Gardner speaks of this as the internet of things, but we think it's bigger than just things, because things and large just sensor-based technology. What is sensor-based technology? A blood glucose monitor. <coughs> That's sensor-based technology. It's not really very sophisticated. It collects a number. It just happens to be a very important number. But it's just a number. The temperature of the ocean, the, 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 uh, the, the height of waves in the ocean, uh, those are just numbers. So it's sensor-based technology, but we think it's much bigger than that. Now, this is not a new concept. These two guys, Sir and Khan, who knows who they are? Ah. Now, so there's a lot of people who claim to be the fathers of the internet. <laughs> Because every good invention, it turns out, has many mothers and fathers. Everybody wants a piece of it. However, these two guys really are the father of the internet. So Serpent Khan in the 
60s, I believe, I read it. They wrote the original specification for IP and TC. And I can't believe how insightful they really were. I've never met Khan, but I have met Sir. He's an amazing man. I mean, he's just, he's, he's very bright, he's witty. He happens to work for Google. Exactly. Well, so Sir, Sir posited some time ago that one day, the cost of sensor technology was going to become so inexpensive that if one of his socks should be separating from its mate, what it would do would be to communicate with its mate where it was located so that it could send out an emergency message. <laughs> was not so far off because this is almost a reality. The cost of sensor technology has absolutely dropped to a point where it's almost rational to be able to realize Surf's vision for his lost <laughs> So let's talk about some of the challenges to, to realize this vision. We are basically becoming an urban society not a rural society. By 2050, 70% of the people are going to live in very small, concentrated land masses we call cities. It isn't that we really don't have enough space on our planet. We actually do have a lot of space on the planet. It's just that everybody wants to live in a certain, very high-density place. We are moving to a, a urban society. By 2050, 70% of people will live in cities. Well, it's also true, and it's actually related, by that time, 70% of greenhouse emissions will come from cities. But that also creates certain issues because with everybody concentrated in one place, when we have an earthquake or we have a flood in Copenhagen, that affects a lot of people's lives. And if they weren't all concentrated in this one place, it wouldn't be as big a problem as it actually ends up being. So we, this, this is sort of a, um, uh, a global megatrend, and it's something we're not going to be able to change People are moving to cities, and they're doing it in Africa, and they're doing it in the United States, and they're absolutely doing it in Asia. Who's been to Shanghai or to Beijing? Those are, I can't, you can't see across the street in Shanghai. It is so polluted. Why is it so polluted? Well, because they have all these businesses there, and, 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 and so many people are concentrated in one place. It's just, it's just a reality. So there's certain megatrends for this, this, this uh, urban world we're about to create for ourselves. And so there are technology trends, and I'm going to speak more about the technology trends. There are socioeconomic trends, such as uh, this global urbanization trend, and there's this interesting factor which has to do with widening income gaps, which is, I mean, that's not a comment that is, um, that, that, that's evaluated, it's just a fact. We have the very, very, very rich, and then we have the very poor. And so when we speak about the face of the pyramid, the pyramid is becoming very, very wide at the bottom and very narrow at the top. It's not a, it's not a comment on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a reality. So there are widening income gaps. And then insofar as policy is concerned, we would like to obtain energy independence, for example. That is a policy. <coughs> we could buy oil from the Middle East. We just think it's not a great idea. We'd love to have energy in the past. Actually, we've achieved that now. It's a whole other story, but we've more or less achieved that. But it's a matter of policy. It's not a matter of something that's preordained. We decide we wish to be energy independent. And the same is true for other nations around the world. And of course, we believe that everybody should have digital access. The only question is, how do, how do they get that? And there's all kinds of questions. We've also related to policy questions relating to utilities ownership as well. So there are some technology challenges. Complexity is, is probably the worst. So what's complexity? We build systems which are just unmanageable and extremely siloed. So if you want to start a business in almost any city of the world, you have to input data into a multiplicity of databases. The interesting part about it is the data that you implement and you input is the same for all the different databases. Who are you? Where is the business located? How many employees is it going to have? What is the character of the business? Is the business going to have any solvents on site? What kinds of energy requirements are, are there going to be? So it turns out 
that the, the constabulary, the police, want this information. The fire department wants this information. The taxing authorities want this information. And guess what? They, none of them share their databases. They are all totally silent. And the police are the worst. I've been there, I've done that. I have been to the Department of Corrections in the state of New York. I have, I mean, I've, you can't, I, they all think their data is too important and too necessary. It must be secure and I'm not sharing my data with them. The only problem is that it's really inefficient. And we tell them, we swear to them, we can make these, we can allow data to be exchanged on a, in a very safe way. And it's almost like talking to a wall that they will have to change. So complexity is basically about information which is collected, but it's not shared. And then we have to be able to unlock the intelligence that's stored in the data. I'm going to talk more about that. And then we have to have it all done securely. We cannot afford targets and even markets and um, whatever the, the most recent hack, or Sony Pictures for that matter. We can't afford this nonsense. It's just crap. We have to be able to secure the, the data that we have because we must be able to live our lives knowing that the information that we put online is sick. It's just that simple. And I'm sure we, we actually now know what happened to Target, what happened to Demon Marcus. We're not so sure about what happened at Sony. But having said that, it's usually a combination of poor architectural design and human failure. Like PCs that are left in people's trunks and have all the social security numbers in the state of New York on that, uh, that hard drive. That is unconscionable. So anyway, so complexity is a problem. We have to be able to unlock the intelligence and it all has to be managed securely. And disruption is where we are today. Who's using Airbnb? Pretty cool, actually. I've never used it, but I sit on the board of directors of a software company here in San Francisco, and one of the other directors, he happens to live in Seattle, but when he comes in, he uses Airbnb to stay when we have a board meeting, and he tells me stories about the places he stays. <laughs> the unwashed Polish guy sleeping on the couch. It's, it's really strange, but he says, you can't. So anyway, Airbnb is, Airbnb is upsetting the model, the hotel model. And I was at the University of uh, 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 Texas A&M, and I was talking to the Vice Chancellor of Engineering, and she was telling me how, how 3D modeling, uh, uh, 3D printing, is changing the way we teach students about visualization and about how, how you build things and how you, how you make something physically. Now, I was educated as a mechanical engineer. Well, it turns out that you can imagine something that as a mechanical engineer we can't get made. Because I think of things as being cut on lathes and milling machines, except you can imagine something and with a 3D printer we make it, but we couldn't machine it. We simply couldn't do it. It's amazing. So she thinks that this is this major dislocation that's going to occur, and I think she's right. And then, of course, we have Uber. Now, Uber's gotten a lot of bad press lately. <laughs> But having said that, Uber is upsetting the whole nature of how we provide transportation systems in cities. And, and whether it's a good idea or it's a bad idea, if you think that the business that you have is secure, like a hotel business or a taxi business or whatever, maybe it's not so secure anymore. And so technology is creating this major dislocation. Business as usual isn't so usual going forward. So let's talk about big data and the insights that are required from big data. Who knows who this is? William Playfair. <laughs> so, so I was here this morning. <laughs> that comment was important for me here. Who it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who was William Playfair? <laughs> well, so you can sort of tell from his hair, and you can sort of tell from his expression, and sort of tell from the lack of light. William Playfair lived in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. 
And William Playfair was the first one to grapple with big data. You think we, big data is a new concept. It is not a new concept. William Playfair invented three things that are totally common to us today, and we take them completely for granted. And what are those three things? They are the bar chart, the line chart, or the line graph, and the pie chart. <laughs> now you might say, uh, big deal. But in that day, this was a really big deal. Being able to display information in a manner which was clear and which was able, from which you were able to draw conclusions, this was a very big deal. And William Playfair's masterful contribution to mankind was this. This is a 250-year chart. Talk about big data. This never existed previously. And so what he did was he grabbed the price of wheat and the price of labor over a 250 year period. And no one had ever done that before and no one ever thought that it was possible to think in those terms. So the concept of grappling with big data and the concept of being able to withdraw something significant from big data, this really, this really goes back quite a, quite a long period of time. Now, it turns out that we collect a lot of data. And data is just a stupid string of ones and zeros. It doesn't really mean very much. But every now and then, we use something called analytics. What's analytics? Analytics is mathematics. Analytics is heuristics. And we apply that mathematics or those heuristics to data, and we turn it into something called information. And every now and then, information, again using analytics, becomes something we call knowledge. And every very rare period of time, we discover something which modifies our behavior. And that is wisdom. And it happens very rare. <laughs> it's true. Now, analytics is really a code name for mathematics, heuristics, computer programming, etc. And that's how you move up this pyramid. And we basically have two kinds of data, although William Playfair didn't understand this. The data he was dealing with was big data. That is data which is collected, but it doesn't really change very quickly. So the price of wheat and the price of, of labor over a 250-year period, that doesn't change very much. The, um, the incidence of viruses in the United States as collected by the Centers for Disease Control, it doesn't change very rapidly. It changes, but not in an instant. However, our parking space in San Francisco, that changes very rapidly. Oh, it's there? Oh, it's gone. Or a parking space in the city of New York. The same thing. So we have two kinds of data. We have transient data, we call that data in motion. And then we have Big data, which doesn't change very quickly. Okay. Now, so we don't always use data in the most, shall we say, profitable way. We collect a lot of data. But what do we do with it? And this is kind of indicative of a lot of those stupid ones and zeros. So this question was asked on Reddit a few years ago. So if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life I have a device in my pocket, actually I left it in my jacket, but I have a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. And I use it to look at pictures of cats. <laughs> the principle that we collect a lot of data, but what do we do with it? Well, not very much. It's just, it's just the way life is. However, every now and then, we collect data, and it's really valuable. Really valuable. So the woman on the right side is... is <laughs> And she is a computer scientist at machine. <laughs> <laughs> so Carol McGregor, 
discovered something that nobody had previously realized. So in a premature infant war, they collect a lot of information. They collect data on blood oxygenation level for the preemies. They collect data on heart rate. They collect data on, on um, um, blood pressure. They collect data on skin tone. They collect lots of data. What do they do with the data? Basically nothing. A nurse comes by and records the data on a chart, and then when they're done recording the data on the chart, nothing happens to it. It goes away. But Carolyn McGregor discovered something really amazing. She determined, from looking at the data of heart rate, that a premature infant was going to sustain an illness within the next 24 hours, and that was indicative of a change in the baby's heart rate. And that the heart rate of a normal infant displays a certain statistical irregularity. But when that infant is going to become sick, the heart rate becomes uncannily regular. Ah, imagine if you could administer antibiotics to an infant child 24 hours before they got sick. So we're not talking about using your cell phone to show your friends pictures of cats. <laughs> we're using this data to save kids' lives. This is really something. So every now and then, data may become this. Or this one. This is <coughs> from <laughs> my alma mater. And so, Carla Roddy had, had a hypothesis. And my hypothesis was, when you throw away trash, it is carried to and disposed of in a local landfill. That's the hypothesis. And so what he and his students did in the city of Seattle was to instrument garbage with RFID sensors. Pizza boxes, old tennis shoes, uh, things you don't even want to touch, all kinds of things. <laughs> and then they tracked where did the garbage go. And to their surprise, they found that some of the garbage was trucked to the state of Virginia. You might say, why? Why would you take garbage from Seattle and track it, truck it all the way to the other side of the United States? That's stupid. Well, we understand why now. The reason is because when the city of Seattle signed contracts with the garbage haulers, they never specified where it was supposed to go. It was just supposed to go away. <laughs> you know, so what people are now asking is, this is maybe not the best way for us to behave. And the city of Seattle, as the city of San Francisco is as well, very green. And to, be, to do this is just plain dumb. And so now they're writing their contracts much, much more carefully. And so the moral of the story is sometimes you get this marvelous result when you collect information. You get a non-obvious answer that you didn't expect to find. And so for people who say, why do we collect all this data? Well, in truth, most of it's useless. Every now and then, it's very material. Here's another one. Arizona State University. Arizona State University, I visited them a number of times. They are amazing. The president is pretty amazing, too. And so they collect data on everything. They create dashboards for everything. They study student success rates. They study research. They, they look at how, uh, what the efficacy of the faculty is. They, now, you might be offended by this, but this is what they do. They track student progress, and they watch everything. They know when students clock with their badges in and out of the library. They know when they go into the cafeteria. They know when they see their guidance counselor. They know. And the list goes on and on and on. <coughs> you might say, well, what good is it? Why should you collect all this data? Because they have used predictive analytics to improve freshman retention rates over the past six years by 7%. Now, this is particularly significant because Arizona State University is what we call the University of Access. 
if you live in the state of Arizona, you get to go. But that doesn't mean you're qualified, but you get to go. So who are the people that are most at risk? Minority. People who do get to go, but you know, they're struggling. And so they use predictive analytics to determine between one and two periods, I forget whether they use orders or semesters, before a student fails, who is going to be at risk? This is really wonderful. Because wouldn't you like to be able to say to a student, you know, you haven't failed yet. <laughs> I know the guy who did this work. He's amazing. He's happy to talk to anybody. It's, it, they're very proud of what they've achieved, and, and, and it's been very significant. They also, they've also grown Arizona State Online 36% in, in a year. 36%. When I visited them, I think it was in 2010, they had like 10,000 students in ASU Online. I think it's up to like 25,000 students in ASU Online. Presently, you think this is a joke? You think this is like a, a fake online course? Wrong. This is accredited schooling. You get to go to school online. So I said, well, of course, you've got to go to Mesa, Arizona sometime and take a real, real live class. It's wrong. You don't. Uh, it's 100% online. And their goal is to take this number to 100,000. This is big stuff. Big stuff. The other thing that, oh, did I miss one? I guess not. So there are some big imperatives, and let me share with you what those imperatives are. One of them, we were speaking about this earlier when I was having coffee, one of them is we do not, from this quote from Al Barber from the University of Colorado, we do not understand exponential relationships as, as a, as a as an entity, we understand linear, but we don't understand exponential. It's just too hard for people to grasp the notion of exponential, but that is what is about to occur. The 21st century will be an exponential dislocation in the creation of information and in a change in the way that people live. And grasping that is really important, especially for educators. Now here's another one. It's called Metcalfe's Law. Who's Metcalf? Who knows who Metcalf is? He's an inventor of Ethernet. He was my fraternity brother. And so Metcalf is Robert Melanchthon Metcalf, and he created this law. And the law says that the value of a telecommunications network goes as the square of the number of nodes connected to the network. You got that? So one fax machine worth Two fax machines, eh, kind of, has some value, I guess. A million fax machines, really valuable. A hundred million fax machines, we can't live without them. Now it turns out we, we pass five fax machines, but it doesn't matter, the principle is the same. So it's really true that we will have 50 million endpoints, new endpoints by 2020. Automobiles and, and blood glucose monitors and heart rate monitors and blood pressure monitors and all kinds of things that, that are hard for you to conceive of today. And it's really true that we are going to create that many new nodes that are creating data, then the value of the telecommunications network it will become exponentially more valuable than it even is today. That's why these networks are so many, we can't live without them. Network goes down, you go home. Can't work, go, go home. There's nothing to do, it's just that simple. <laughs> and so, we need something. We need something we call Fast IT. What's Fast IT? Well, we have a model for that. And what Fast IT is basically the implementation of simple architectures, architectures which are inherently smart, and architectures which are uh, inherently <coughs> secure. I, this, that's another talk unto itself. And basically, it does have, a, it does have a, a model to it, but you can think of it as a physical infrastructure on the bottom, 
which consists of optics and, and, and wires and, and, and switches and physical media. And at the top, lots of applications, uh, such as those applications at Arizona State. And in the middle, lots of software. And so, and, and that software is never seen by the user, but it's really important. So fast IT involves physical networks, applications, and middleware is the term that we use, but it uh, doesn't really tell you very much. So there are some big opportunities for educators. One of them is that you have to realize something. Most of the time, we hide new technologies, and, and I, I've been in the middle of a number of them, and you hide them because it's worth a lot of money for you to hide them. However, having said that, we exaggerate them at first, but if we're right, the long-term benefits even exceed the exaggerations, which is where we are basically with, say, uh, mobile phone technology. And it's where we are with the penetration of broadband and the internet. As much as we hide that, its value is even greater as people come up with new mobile apps and people come up with new ways to improve farming in, uh, in Africa. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So here's something that's going to impact education, video. And I have visited the Tech de Monterey, and the Tech de Monterey is amazing. They have been beaming basically Spanish language content, sending Spanish language content over all of Mexico for years and years and years. And I visited their studio in Monterey, and a professor sits in a classroom in Monterey, and he has two-way synchronous communication with classrooms all over the country, but now all over the world. It's mostly Spanish language, but that's, basically, that's a lot of people. That's all of South America, a lot of North America, and now Europe and other places in the world. The tech is a, is a paragon for the use of video as a means to distribute content. Here's a question for you. Do we need less teachers? No. There is somebody, I'm sure, who is the very best calculus or differential equations teacher around. They are just amazing. However, and that person could, could teach over video link differential equations to a classroom of students. But we still need teachers in the classroom because there will be gifted students in the classroom that need to be more challenged and there's going to be other students in the classroom that are slow and they don't get it. They need personal help. So sometimes teachers think, oh, well, you're going to use technology and take away my job. Absolutely not. But I do believe that there are some great chemistry teachers and some great calculus and some great Spanish and some great, you fill in the blank, teachers around this world that we should be employing to teach people those skills. And then we need teachers to, to assist the students in the classrooms as well. But the tech stands for the principle that you use video and you do displace the sage on the stage. San Jose State is also very interesting because Mo Kayumi, who's the president of San Jose State, has done amazing things at that university. They now have um, the ability for any student to bring their own device to class, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a um, an Android device, whether it's an Apple device, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a laptop, whether it's whatever, and then they have the network secured and they have the network sufficiently aware so that you can get the information you need synchronously, synchronous, synchronously or asynchronously. They video capture lectures. So that if you don't want to sit in class but you want to watch the lecture outside of class, fine. If you want to search the lecture and find the word um, Fourier, you can do that. When did the professor mention Fourier? And then you can go find it. And so they, they have done amazing things. And, and, and I have to admit, sometimes with the faculty kicking and screaming. However, the president said, we have to change. And they have done that. They've implemented e-textbooks. They've also done some experiments with MOOCs. And MOOCs are very interesting because you know, there was a time a couple of years ago where people thought MOOCs are the way of the future. It turns out they are not the way of the future. However, <laughs> they did some interesting basic work on what works and what doesn't work. And that's also interesting. So San Jose State is, is a, stands for the principle that content delivery is being transformed. Here's another one that's really amazing. 
So it used to be that we would train nurses and doctors who were going to become surgical nurses and surgeons using cadavers. It turns out that that's really not a very efficient way to teach people about the human body. Even though that is how it had been done for hundreds of years. So the Canadians, this, the, 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 main, the main graphic in the middle comes from Canada. The Canadians decided, I can't we teach surgical nurses and doctors who are going to become surgeons how the human body works using virtual reality. And it turns out that that really does work. Because it turns out that most of us are all built the same, with the exception of anomalies. But, but anomalies are just that. They are the exception rather than the rule. The first place we have to start when we teach people about the human body is what is the rule, not the exception. What is the rule? And so they use virtual reality to teach people this is how the body is put together. And this is how the pieces connect. So. And they have decided that Canada will be a leader, a global leader, in the use of virtual reality to teach doctors and nurses and those they need to be successful. Here's another one that's interesting. Now this one is, this one is a, um, um, what's the right word there? A test, uh, not a test, a, a theory. This, this one has, yet, has not yet been implemented. This one comes from Norway. And the Norwegians said, Again, this, is, this is, comes under the rubric of how will education change in the future. The Norwegians said, you know, there's a better way to teach students geology. Geology is kind of tough because when you look at a rock, what you see? A rock. It's a rock. I mean, it's, but when a geologist looks at a rock, the rock is actually formed in different ways and it occurred over millions of years and it's, it's igneous and it's sedimentary and it's, it's been shifted and it's, it's all different things. But I don't see it. I don't see it because I'm just ignorant. So they said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you could look at the rock as something, we'll call it Google Glass, just for one of a better term. And then that, that Google Glass was connected to tablets and you'd be able to look at that rock and then what you'd be able to do is put lines on the rock and say, tell me what I am looking at. And then using computer animation, you would have displayed in three dimensions what it was that you were looking at. And that would be amazing. This takes a lot of computer modeling and a lot of software and a lot of computer resources. But you know what? This would be wonderful because I lost on me when I looked at the rocks around us. But this would teach people. Plus, if you had this, you could then project that to people who were not in the field. And they could learn too. So when you say, how will education be disrupted by these new technologies? Manifestly so. And even though this one is just a proof of concept, Somebody's going to figure out how to do this. And I don't know if it's in geology, or it's in meteorology, or it's in metallurgy. Someone's going to figure out how to do this, and they will transform the way that that is taught to students. And then we have Ray Kurzweil. Who's heard of Ray Kurzweil? Yeah. So Ray Kurzweil wrote a book a number of years ago called The Singularity is Near. Who's heard of The Singularity is Near? Right, so I don't kind of talk about the singularities here, but Kurzweil is pretty amazing. I'm mean, a pretty amazing guy. The last book he wrote was called How to Create a Mind. And in How to Create a Mind, Kurzweil, who's a futurist, we'll, we'll call him that for want of a better term, he talks about, he talks about how, the, how is the human brain constructed. And it turns out that the human brain is constructed with 300 million pattern recognition modules. Language is the recognition of patterns. That's all language is. So why is it that you can take a child who is five from San Francisco to Shanghai, and in three months the child is speaking Mandarin? How does that happen? When I go to China, it's like dogs barking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mandarin has four different tones, and Cantonese with eight tones, and oh, gee. Anyway, so Kurzweil says the brain is, 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 consists of 300 million pattern recognition modules. 
remember when you were a kid and your parents told you, you only use a fraction of your brain, if you use the whole brain, think of what you'd be able to achieve. Turns out that's a lie. <laughs> you use the whole brain. By the time we are teenagers, the 300 million pattern recognition modules are full. And it is really true, you have to lose something to add something new. Interesting, huh? So Kurzweil says, what if there was a brain extension app? <laughs> what if it was possible that instead of 300 million pattern recognition modules, I had a billion pattern recognition modules? What is it that I would be able to think of? Well, guess what? We have the cloud. The cloud is this elastic computing medium that is used for doing computation, but it's also used for storage. It's out there. Mm -hmm. And we understand the concept of wireless, and there's actually legitimate and verified and vetted university research which shows that, that there are telepathic mechanisms by which we can relate to, to things. It sounds really far out, but it turns out to be real. And so what if I could think, and via a cloud extension or brain extension app, I could get access to another 700 million pattern recognition modules? What is it that I would be able to think of? Wouldn't that be absolutely amazing? Now, it's too late for Einstein because he passed away before this technology. And it's too late for, for Dirac, and it's too late for Niels Bohr, and it's too late for any number of others. It's not too late for Stephen Hawking. So Kurzweil believes he will never die. I listened to an interview on NPR. Kurzweil believes that his mind will live in the cloud forever. And yours will too. So how do we achieve this? Well, one of the ways we achieve this is by a partnership between the public and private citizens. But we cannot forget people. They're in the equation as well. And we also should not forget professors. This model comes from a, a professor at the University of Santiago who said, you know, professors are the place where very many, very many smart people all over the world work. We need, so the way we go forward is with what we call the 5P So let me leave you with this Chinese proverb, because this is a long-term journey we are on. It is really true that one generation gets to plant the trees, but another one gets the shade. So I may never have a brain extension application. Maybe, I don't know, maybe. Maybe our children will. That's going to be a really different 